Hey guys and girls, before we get started with this week's episode, just wanted to let you know we have an exciting announcement. I just completed a five-part premium audio series with multi-time black belt world champion Emily Kwok. You might know Emily from her amazing instructionals that she did alongside Stefan Kesting, How to Defeat the Bigger, Stronger Opponent. Emily is a Marcelo Garcia black belt, and in this series we go deep into the study of peak performance and we talk about the methods that she used to achieve elite world champion status at black belt. So if you want to check that out, go to premium.bjjmentalmodels.com. There's a free trial so you can get access to this without paying anything, and if you don't like it, you can just cancel and let me know. Hope you like it. On to the show. Hey, welcome to BJJ Mental Models, episode 149. I'm Steve Kwan. BJJ Mental Models is your guide to a conceptual and intelligent jiu-jitsu approach. And today, got a living legend here, Mr. Carl Pravic, a.k.a. the Silver Fox. Carl, how are you doing? Good, how are you? I am also doing well. I was just telling you, you know, my daughter had a, a cold, and of course she gave it to me and to other people in the oh. house. But I, I think we're all on the mend now, which is good. It's just like, like I was saying before the call, the thing is, it, you know, it used to be that getting a cold was not a big deal. But now every time, so, you know, my daughter gets a cold because kids, when they get sick, they can take a turn for the worst real fast. You have to worry like, oh, God, does she have COVID? Is she going to spread it to a million people? But we we got her tested, just a cold. So we're all good. Finally get to record with you, which I'm super happy about. No, it's awesome. Yeah, yeah, I certainly understand. I think current day and age, it's anybody has allergies, sniffles, anything. It's the first thing is like, <laughs> let's go get tested, you know, but uh, I'm glad she's doing OK. Yeah, well, I am glad to have a chance to talk to you, too. You have been a, a frequently requested guest for a long time. I mean, of course, you've are. I, I hope you don't mind me saying, but you are a, a living jujitsu legend, at least in my opinion, here in North America. You're... I certainly appreciate that. <laughs> and it's been awesome seeing how active you are in the content creation when it comes to jujitsu. I know that you've got an awesome like channel slash podcast that you do. I see your stuff all over Reddit and our community asked me to reach out to you because one thing that we specifically wanted to talk about is how to deal with these damn young people. You know, they're just, they're all energetic, they're athletic, they try to smash all of us old people. And I would just, I'd love to get your opinion on this. On the prior episode that we did, I had the uh, the Howders on, Chris and Melissa Howder, yeah. and they were talking about their experiences just getting older and becoming, you know, elder statesmen slash stateswomen in this sport, and how that changes their relationship with the sport. And something that I am definitely feeling, I, I've never been an athlete, I've always been kind of like a casual hobbyist, I don't have a lot of physical physical gifts compared to some of the guys that I train with. So the game that I always have is, okay, how do I overcome these giant, massive, like 20 year old wrestler beasts who show up at the gym and want to throw me around? <laughs> yeah. And I think that's something that everyone can relate to. I would love to get your feeling on this because you are, I mean, this is your calling card, right? This is what you're known for is taking these damn kids down a peg or two. So with that said, maybe you can tell me, man, what's your secret? Well, you know, before, before we go down that path, you know, it's funny. I don't consider myself, you know, older. I, I, I consider myself fairly young, you know, until I look in the mirror. <laughs> so basically my mentality is very different from, from reality. So I, you know, when I go train, I don't, I don't like look at it as like, you know, it's me versus the young, young, young guys. I, I look at it as I'm here to try to make my jujitsu better and, and, and try to see, you know, what I can do. I think, you know, for me, and, and you're going to get a lot of different advices from people depending on what their experience are and, and, and jujitsu and life experience and so forth. Me personally, I believe there's one thing that you can continue to improve no matter what your age is and that's technique. Mm -hmm. So I'm very technique centric. I believe that this philosophy not just applies to people that are older, but uh, than than the average practitioner, but also, to a smaller practitioner, which is kind of what the, you know, the original message of jujitsu, Brazilian jujitsu was, is, you know, a smaller guy can, you know, eventually out, outsmart, out technique, a, a much larger, more athletic guy. Hopefully, you know, they have more knowledge. I think where it becomes difficult is in the early days. And I had a very hard early start is because if you're not super athletic and you're smaller, you're going to have a harder time because you don't have the toolbox. You don't have 
sort of the, the techniques and, and the, you know, you don't have your game home in such a way where your transitions are very smooth and, and efficient. You know, you, I, I always try to make less movement, make the other guy more, have more movement. So I appear basically what I'm doing to them is, you know, I'm constantly attacking and it just looks like I'm way faster than they are. It's just that I'm, I'm seeing things before they do. So I encourage people to just kind of suck it up through the early stages of, or Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu growth, so eventually you will get to a point where you will have, you know, more techniques in your arsenal. You have more efficient transitions. You're more precise, and you can see things before they actually happen. So you can. It looks like you're way faster than you know a guy that may be more athletic, faster, and and bigger. So that's kind of my philosophy as far as that goes. I think one of the coolest things about this sport is that it actually lives up to the promise. I mean, I got into jujitsu for what sounds like a very similar reason to why you did, which is that jujitsu was advertised as a way that a smaller, weaker opponent can use leverage to defeat a much larger, stronger opponent and to do so in a gentle manner. Right. And I, I think that's important if your goal is, you know, if you're not going out there to inflict violence, I think it's wonderful that there is a martial art that is about de-escalation like jujitsu is. But the crazy thing about jujitsu is that it does actually work. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I've, I'm a black belt. I've been training for 13 years. I am not athletic at all. But if you put me in there with a super athletic white belt or blue belt or whatever, you know, I'm off the floor with them because the techniques actually they do work. And that's one of the cool things about about the sport versus other martial arts is that it actually lives up to the advertising. The thing, though, that I hear from a lot of people is that they get very discouraged because they, especially early on in their journey, they're not seeing the results of this. And I understand it, right? When you're a white belt and you're going in there and you're giving up 50 to 100 pounds against some giant monster, you're probably going to get killed. And even as a blue belt or even as a purple sometimes, it can be really frustrating because you might not, as you mentioned, have the finesse to deal with someone that big and that strong. And and for me personally, I feel like it wasn't until I got to brown belt, maybe even early black belt, that I felt really comfortable with opponents of any size. Yeah. Uh, you know, you can put me in there with someone who's like a 250 pound muscle man and I am I'm not worried about my health. I'm not worried about my defense. It makes no difference to me how big my opponent is really in terms of my anxiety level. I wonder what your experience was. At what point do you feel it's normal for people to really start getting comfortable punching above their weight classes? Yeah, uh, you raised some really good points. So let me just kind of, I want to come back. So remind me because I frequently lose my train of thought. I want to come back to sport versus art. But to address your point, I think it's a very good one. I, I think I share a very similar experience where at Brown Bell, I start to feel very comfortable going against people that are, you know, way bigger and, and stronger than I am and kind of better understand jiu-jitsu. So I do agree it works. It's proven. What other martial arts do you see? And, you know, in, at least in the sports arena where people, where you have absolute weight classes, <laughs> what other martial art do you have? Any weight class can go against any other weight class. Golf, ping pong. <laughs> That's about it. <laughs> <laughs> but in combat combat sports, I, I can't think of off the top of my head. I can't think of any other sport or any other martial art where you don't have weight classes effectively, which is definition of the absolute division. Mm -hmm. So you will see smaller guys beating bigger guys because they're technically better. But that there there's the rub. It's the in the early stages. So even if you get a purple belt, which to me is probably the most significant belt in Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, you know, roughly at purple, even brown. That's when you start to have enough of a toolbox, enough of understanding of the art to have more efficient transition, to foresee what is happening, to be able to out finesse the, the strength, explosiveness, you know, athleticism. So, yes, what I have to say to those guys is just just carry on, just bear it and just keep going because it will turn. But it's it's a matter of time because, you, you know, it's it, this is not magic. You know, you have six months of uh, Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu and a guy that's just athletic walks in day one, that six month ain't going to do it. Mm -hmm. You know, it may, you know, five years will do it. Six years will do it, but not six months. So there is certain, yes, it takes time to acquire the knowledge, but it's not just a brain acqu acquisition. It has to be sort of downloaded into your body and effectively be coordinated in such a way that your game becomes you know, can I actually overcome a larger, more explosive opponent? So it takes time. 
but it is proven that it does work. Yeah, I think that the the challenge that a lot of people newer to the art have is that they're not looking at a long time horizon. And this might be due to the fact that, of course, when you start off, odds are when you start off, you're going to be younger, right? You know, if you take your average black belt and your average white belt, I, I can't say this for sure, but I would assume that, of course, there's going to be a lot of black belts who are, you know, gray haired, they're older, they've been around for ages, they have a long time horizon in terms of their perspective of the art. Yes. Whereas when you're a white belt, six months feels like a lifetime. And so it feels like if you've been training for six months or 12 months, it feels like you're basically a veteran, you know, at least compared to the other white belts. And so it can be frustrating when you're not able to go in there and just go all hoist Gracie on these guys and destroy them all. Right. That's what you want. But in reality, it takes longer than that. And I remember feeling this. I remember when I got my blue belt. And of course, when you are a white belt, you know, man, blue belt seems like this insurmountable goal. I remember being a white belt and looking reverently at these blue belts like they were, you know, wise masters. Of course, now a blue belt is, is a black belt. You don't think twice about someone who has a blue belt, right? It's just a belt. But when you're a white belt and you come in and you see all of these people who have color on their waist, you realize, you think, man, these guys must be amazing. And so then one day after however long it takes you to get your blue belt, you finally get it and you feel like now you're somebody but you're still getting smashed and sometimes even by big giant white belts. Right. And yeah. that can be very frustrating because you feel like at blue belt, you should be good enough to take on all comers. But once you get to, to black belt, you've been around for a long time. You realize, look, if you want to punch up weight classes or I guess grapple up weight classes, it takes a long time to get that comfortable and that fluid where you can do that. And you shouldn't be beating yourself up because you're a blue belt and you're still struggling with white belts that I would consider to be normal, especially when you're going when there's a massive size discrepancy. Very true. And I think that's one of the you know, like you talk about the blue belt blues where a lot of blue belts quit. I think there's there's a variety of reasons, but that is definitely one of them where, you know, they finally make it to that blue blue belt and, and you know, they will still lose the white belt. So, you know, it, it's up to us instructors because it can be very frustrating where. You know, like you said, you know, and, and is it when a white belt, you know, if you're talking to them in, a, in terms of, you know, just think about where you're going to be in two years, that's like, you know, oh man, two years. It's like, to yeah. me, two years, I'm, I'm working on, on, on things for two years, you know, and, mm. but, but to them, it's, it's, you know, when you're just starting out, you have zero time and it, two years seems very, very long. So I try to encourage people. I think, you know, it's, it's a variety of ways you could try to make them understand better what the, what the path is, you know, managing the expectations, but also making them understand that, like, listen, if I teach you, you know, between the takedown and, you know, a couple of sequences on the ground between all of them for the class, there's 10 different elements, you know, you, you know, unless you're really talented, you're probably not going to, you know, forget about master them, but even understand the 10 or even remember 10 elements. Mm -hmm. But if you can remember three, that's a good day. Like every day needs to be evaluated like, okay, I just want to do a little bit better. I want to learn. I want to learn a new thing. I want to learn either a new thing or to do something better. That's it. That is your goal. I think when people start to talk about like, I can, you know, I want to beat this guy. I want to, I want to get a blue belt. It, it just, you know, and listen, I, I've been in that path as well. I, I understand that mentality because this, this is how we think as humans. But the problem with that becomes a very, very frustrating path and only very select few that that kind of view the path in that way will survive, not because they're just getting beat, but it just cannot handle failure, the frustration, the, you know, the disappointment. So I think if you manage your expectations in a way, I, I try to tell people every time in the class, your goal is to try to do something a little bit better or learn a few things. That's it. It's very simple. You'll have a much enjoy more enjoyable path. You will look at it in a more positive way manner training versus kind of walking out. I was like, shit, I suck. Yeah. I used to be like that too. And I like, that's, it's, it's very, very negative way of thinking. And, and what winds up happening, everybody goes through slumps. And when you have that way of thinking, the slumps become much more pronounced and much deeper, much longer lasting versus kind of like, okay, you know, I'm in a slump. It's okay. I just come in, you know, I'm trying to work on this. Maybe I'll, I'll change it up a little bit because I've been playing with this too much focused on this one thing. Let me just do something a little bit different. And, you know, two, three weeks, sometimes two, three months, you're out. I, I had a slump when I was a blue belt for it, like lasted literally a year and a half. Mm -hmm. I hate, I like, I don't know why I didn't quit, but I just, I, it was just very, very frustrating for me. 
So I, when I tell people, when I give my advice, it's not because I'm smarter. I just live that, what they're going through, and, and I'm trying to make their path easier than mine was, you know? It is funny because I remember the same thing. I mean, when you're new, you will inevitably hit a slump or a plateau. And of course, at the time, it feels like an existential crisis. <laughs> if, if, you feel, if you feel like your training partners are getting better than you, it feels like the world is ending. But of course, by the time you get to black belt, you hit a slump like every year. At this point in time, yeah. if I hit a slump, my, my thought is, oh, well. Sometimes it's even a couple of times a year, yeah. Yeah, yeah. My thought is, well, it's been about a year. That's about right. You know, it's about time for another one of these. And the mindset that I eventually developed as I got older was I actually almost look forward to slumps now because I know that if I hit a plateau or a slump, that's usually right before I'm going to hit some big breakthrough moment. So now when I hit a slump, I've been able to kind of alter my mindset. So rather than getting depressed about it, I can think, well, the good news about the slump is it means that probably within a month or two, something's going to happen that's going to totally change my game. I just need to keep pushing and keep working at it and keep trying and not beat myself up over the fact that I'm not performing the way that I want. Yeah, that's why I, I define slumps to people as something more along the, these lines. It's you basically acquired a lot of knowledge that is not fully automatic to your body yet. And that's why you are in a, in a slump in quotes. And I'm using the air quotes as, as, as we speak, because your drill, it's, it's, it's there, but it's not working smoothly. It's sort of like grinding gears as you're learning to drive a, a, a stick shift. And as soon as you kind of like these elements start to pop in place, you go, you know, progression in jiu-jitsu is not a straight line. It's not a straight line up. It's usually like you go like really rapid growth. And then you kind of, when you get a slump, it's not, you, you're not getting worse. It's just sort of like you're muddling through for a couple of weeks, sometimes even a couple of months. And then you suddenly hit that upswing again. Mm -hmm. So I think if people look at it as such, it's like you're basically acquired a lot of knowledge, but it is not automatic. It is not sort of uh, muscle memory yet. And that's once that happens, everything's going to kick into full gear. And so look forward to it. You know, it will happen. It's just a matter of time. Yeah. Something that we're, we're kind of dancing around here, which I think is actually key when you have the experience advantage, which is a nice way to say you're probably older. One of the, the keys to that is that you have the benefit of a longer window of time and, and the benefit of patience. That to me is one of the main things from a strategy standpoint that matters when you're going up against someone who's much younger. You have kind of a more wise perspective because like you brought up, you have a longer window of time, a longer understanding of time, a better understanding of the fact that peaks and valleys in your training or natural and this can manifest in your game too because a lot of the time the older person is going to be way more patient in their roles than a younger person will be that is how, how could i describe this i guess i would say that when i was talking to uh, chris howder about this he was explaining that there's he looks at jujitsu as kind of three parts. There's the body, the mind, and the spirit. And when you are young and new, you kind of overweight the importance of the body. You're just going on athleticism and you're not really doing much else. But of course, as you mature and get more experience, uh, get more color on your belt, you eventually start leaning onto the other areas where you start thinking strategically. You start even thinking philosophically about what jujitsu is all about. And you have a, a wider view. Whereas I find with, with people who are younger, and often very explosive and athletic their focus is just smash <laughs> and often if you can if you can slow them down a bit i find that is so key to dealing with the young explosive guys and i find it easier in the gi than in no gi personally i find the first thing to do with the young guys is you've got to get them to slow down to your speed rather than trying to ramp up to match their speed which is always a losing battle I have a bit of a dichotomy here because for me, as you know, when you, I started training Brazilian Jiu Jitsu in 93, back then it was not available every single day of the week. You know, at the time I was still doing mostly striking. So basically I would train once or twice a week for a few years. And then I'd start to ramp up more, you know, three or four times a week, uh, doing Brazilian Jiu Jitsu and two or three striking. And then eventually, you know, transition all into Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. So when I'm looking back at, you know, 28 years, you know, a year or two is not that significant amount of time versus, you know, if you just started and looking forward for two years. But as a person, I'm highly impatient. So it's kind of reflected in my game because, you know, when I'm going with somebody relatively, you know, large and explosive and, and athletic, but, you know, even if they're very skilled, like I like training very much with Nick Rodriguez when, you know, he was training at Henzo's. You know, he's a very good student of the game too, and he became very good very quickly. But basically, 
you know, when we used to train, it would involve him tossing me around like a seal, you know, like seal tosses the ball at the aquarium. And I'd, <laughs> I'd be flying through the air and basically trying to get, you know, either a good grip on the arm or head and arm, you know, that I could do something with. So basically what I'm, when I'm facing somebody that's larger, I think you actually need to go faster than they do because even if they have less knowledge, it's easier for them to, especially with the gi, to just slow you down. Once they slow you down, you're in their game. But you need to understand like what that means going fast. It doesn't mean that you're faster moving. It's just you're more probably more efficient in your transitions. So I can, you know, because I have experienced this is where the experience in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu comes in handy. You've been training for a long time. Therefore, you know the patterns of how things go. Sometimes they go off pattern, but you know, you've know you been training 10, 15, 20 years. You've seen almost, not all the patterns, but a large majority of patterns, how things, you know, if he does this, this is how the sequence goes and this is how I can counter that sequence. So if you know where he's going, I can head him off at the pass and kind of make him sort of almost overshoot or, or wind up getting caught in a compromising position or, or where I take the momentum and now I go after him and now he's defending. So it's sort of, I'm going faster in quotes, but I'm not, I'm, I'm kind of transitioning from a position to an attack in a more efficient manner. So it appears one thing that I, I, I just have an example. I might try to cover it on my on my role with the Fox tomorrow on YouTube, which is every Friday, 10 30 a.m. Eastern time. But I, you know, I had two of my students uh, training on Tuesday. They're both fairly big guys, you know, both, you know, one is a blue belt, the other one is a white belt. And the blue belt is trying to rip a Kimura. And he just kept, you know, like he ripped it five times and he sort of like got a little like, okay, what am I going to do with this? And the white belt wind up escaping. And, you know, they're both significantly bigger and stronger than I am. And I was like, let me get in here. All right. You got a good grip on your gi? Go. And I just pulled. It wasn't going. I went to an arm bar and it was done because I changed the angle. Mm -hmm. So this is how I approach going with bigger, faster, stronger guys is, you know, I know how to change the angles. I know if they're defending one thing, what they're leaving on a silver platter for me to take fairly easily rather than trying to insist on that one thing that I originally set out to get. So that's kind of my approach to to do, dealing with kind of stronger, more athletic guys. Yeah, that that makes total sense. It's something that I have settled on as a definition, and I'd be curious to know if you agree with this definition, is I like to make a distinction between speed and fluidity. Yes. And, and by that, I mean, look, there is speed, which is an element of athleticism, basically like how fast can your muscles propel your body to go? And that's something that white belts will often rely on because especially if they're younger, they usually have that athletic advantage and they can do all sorts of crazy power doubles and backflips and weird stuff. But there's a difference between speed and fluidity. And fluidity is just where you are so experienced at jujitsu and you have the movement so ingrained that, and like you said, you know the predictable responses to what your opponent is going to do that you can react super, super fast to everything because you see it coming. And so to an outsider, it looks like you're moving a hundred miles an hour, but that's actually not the case. You might even be moving relatively slow in the grand scheme of things, but simply because you're so fluid, it looks like you're just never stopping. But really, you're just constantly transitioning, constantly chaining together attacks, constantly making sure you've got a dominant angle on your opponent. And that, that's a very distinct game plan than just being fast, because it's possible to be fast, but not actually know what you're doing, right? You're just basically throwing your body at the person. And I mean, if you want an example of that, look at a white belt trying to do a guard pass versus a black belt who's got like a really, really good matador pass. The white belt is usually just throwing their body forward and, and just propelling and propelling and propelling, but they're leaving tons of openings that usually result in them getting swept because they're leaning too far forward. Whereas a black belt, man, it, it looks like they're moving 100 miles an hour, but really it's just constant pivots and switches. And it's not that the velocity is that high, it's that the fluidity is very, very high. Yeah, I, I like that name very much, fluidity, actually. I wrote a book. It's, it's more of a pamphlet because I don't like to write, but it's got a lot of pictures. I call it fluid BJJ. That's the whole idea. Mm -hmm. You move with purpose, but with efficiency. Mm -hmm. And if I know what I'm doing, then I can be very efficient. 
And that's the whole point. That To me, that's the ultimate goal of the game is to know where your opponent is going. And, and basically, you know, by the time he gets there, he's, he's caught in a submission because I know what he's going to do. I know how he's going to react. And so I think it is, you know, the fluidity, like I said, I kind of backed off the name because I had, you know, people were like, I remember I was doing a podcast and like, okay, where can people find you? I said, well, I got this book, Fluid BJJ. So I have a website, fluidbjj.com. And then I have this, uh, you know, troubleshooting on YouTube. It's called Roll with the Fox. And then I have silverfoxbjj.com. And as I'm <laughs> saying it, I'm like, you know, I just spit out three names. Nobody's going to remember, you know, anything. So I've basically rolled that everything back. It's very easy to find me everywhere. It's like Silver Fox BJJ. But the point is that I'm a big fan of fluid. You know, I do like to train in the water as well. But if you look at fluid BJJ, it's more of a concept as opposed to, you know, just me training in the water. And you exactly said it. It's it's efficiency of movement. Like I said, I know exactly where he's going. And you know, if I'm wrong, then that's when probably I'm gonna I'm gonna be. Or if I if I'm wrong, or if I don't execute properly, I will be put on the defensive. But otherwise, if I do it, you know, if I'm right, which I'm mo- almost always, you know, when I'm training. And if I execute properly, I'm basically it's a, the the submission is happening very very fast. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I I love that that idea of basically replacing speed with fluidity, because the thing about fluidity is you can do that even if you're not super athletic, whereas just being fast requires a degree of, of raw power and athleticism that not everyone will have. And even the people who have it will lose it as they age. But fluidity is something that you can retain into your later years. I mean, my... And continue to improve. Exactly. And it can continue to improve. It's um, This is something I thought about when I was, you know, getting my, my blue belt and purple belt is what do I want to invest in in jujitsu? For me, I, I mean, I do jujitsu for fun. I'm not a competitor. And I realized, look, I mean, it, from a physical standpoint, all of my physical tools are going to just gradually wane as I get older but my technique and my fluidity can always improve. And that that is such a good investment and something that I think pretty much everyone should be focusing on is, you know, you brought up a great example, which is trying to rip on a Kimura that you're just not going to get. I had this problem for the longest time, which is that I thought I, I sucked at Kimuras because every time I would get into that Kimura position, my opponent would just grab their gi and I just couldn't break the grip and I'd be so focused on trying to break that grip because I really wanted that Kimura. And I thought, oh man, I must suck because I just can't get this. But I realized at some point, I've just, I've got a bad case of like tunnel vision here. I could easily switch to an arm bar, <laughs> but yeah. I'm just choosing not to because I'm being stupid and stubborn. And if I'm practicing jujitsu the way that it's intended, I should be going with the path of least resistance, right? If I have a situation where I can switch to something that is easier, I should should probably do that and that's especially important if you're fighting a big strong person right because sometimes if i mean if they grab onto their gi and they don't want you to get that kimura sometimes it's just not going to happen but yeah there's always another option and fluidity presents that to you i absolutely agree Nice. So something I would I would like to ask you while we're on this topic is about injury prevention. I don't know if this is actually true or not, but most people seem to be under the impression that they're they're more likely to get injured if they're rolling with with bigger or younger people. I don't know if that's actually entirely true. I mean, from my experience, actually, most of the bigger guys that I roll with are so in tune with the fact that they're bigger, that they're terrified of hurting you. So actually, I find when I get injured, it's usually some small person who wants to do backflips and they kick me in the head by accident. (laughs) But I I would love to get your perspective on someone who's trying to, you know, prioritize their own longevity. When you go in there and you're, you know, you're sparring with a white belt who's like a D1 college wrestler, and you know that this thing is going to get intense pretty quickly. What do you do to minimize the risk of, of injury for yourself and to prioritize your own longevity. Yeah, that's a very good point. I agree with you that I don't think, you know, the size of the training partner or age of the training partner is is sort of determining factor how likely people are to get hurt. I think it's more a function of personality and sort of what mindset they're going into the academy with. You know, for me, if I'm going with somebody, you know, I I, I have a a very good example. I had the guy, the guy I had was like a you know, uh, came in with blue belt and a four stripe blue belt with four stripes, pretty, pretty big, young athletic guy walks into my Academy and he's like, you know, from a foreign country, I never met him in my life. And he's, and he's like, my instructor told me to, to train with you. And I'm like, you know, I was a little perturbed because, you know, and, and I'm, 
uh, this was a stupid on, on my part is because three days later, I'm, I'm flying out to Germany to do, you know, a couple of seminars and a weekend long camp. So if I get hurt, there isn't, you know, I'm not flying out. All this stuff is getting postponed or, you know, but so I kind of sent him to, you know, go with this guy first. And then, you know, like you, you could see like other guys want to train with him. He didn't want to train with him. I said, all right, let's go. So basically what I do is I shut him down very quickly. I don't take any chances, you know, because if I just kind of let him operate, you know, a lot of people mistake sort of when you let them kind of, you know, kind of uh, that feeling out process, they don't have any feeling out. You can kind of almost read their mind. Mm-hmm. So certain people have like, they want to try to kind of learn, they want to train and they want to, but there's some guys that want to see like what they want to do. And like, I, I've never met this guy. I want to see how good he is. So there is no feeling out. And if I try to make it like a feeling out process, that's when you're likely to get hurt. So if that guy walks into my academy, wants to train with me right off the bat and, and kind of is like athletic and already has knowledge of jujitsu, which means that he should understand sort of the certain, you know, uh, etiquette and so forth. Okay. Then, then it's going to be fast. It's going to be three submissions very fast and we're done. Mm-hmm. So basically you're talking of almost like a dojo storm scenario where someone just crashes your place and wants to take out the head instructor. Is that what you're talking about? Yeah. You know, like, listen, if you want to train, I, you know, I accommodate, but I'm listen, you know, here's the reality. I'm, I'm hurt pretty much <laughs> most of the time. It's just a question how, how bad it is. Is it how, you know, so I train every day, you know, some days I want to have a life light training day. I, a guy walks in, never met me and wants to train. And it's not like, you know, hey, uh, I'm here, you know, visiting. Can I train in your academy for, for a few days? I have no problem with that, you know, but, you know, they want, they come to me. I want to train with you. Well, you see the, there's, a, you know, 30 other people on the mats. Why you want to train with me? Because you want to see, you know, you want to see what I got, basically. That's what you're telling me. Yeah. That's what I understand. That's what I hear. So that's, especially when these guys are significant larger. And I've had instances, where guys like 250 and up literally walked in and like, I want to train with you. And they come at me like bad out of hell. Like they literally come out like it's, it's a fight. And that's happened to me multiple times, you know? So you got to go, like, you got to be able to turn it on a dime because if you can't read their intensity very quickly, you will get hurt or you have a possibility of get, getting hurt. Now let's go back to the other one where you're training with your regular training partners. There are some large guys that are very, very skilled and very aware of, of kind of the, the size differential. And it's actually more fun for them because when I train with a big guy that kind of puts their strength on the shelf, I'll put my transition speed on the shelf as well. Mm -hmm. So if I catch him with something and I know if I I can shut it down very quickly, I don't shut it down because I want to see where it's going to go. So it benefits me because I can let him kind of live another another sequence, another iteration of, of the move. So he can kind of see what is a follow-up and I can see what, what's another follow-up. But if, if, if the guy is using a lot of strength, then I have to use my, you know, efficiency of transitions. And once I'm in a position to shut it down, I have to shut it down quickly. So people, you know, when, when people go train with each other, they don't understand that, okay, if we move slower, that's not necessarily better because slower doesn't mean that it's, it's sort of like you give it up something. You're already lower ranked than, than I am. So in, at least in theory, you have less skill. So therefore, moving slower is better for you. Now you're bigger, stronger. So now you have that advantage. So if I'm putting all my attributes on the shelf, you got to put something on the shelf as well. Otherwise, we're all using all our attributes Then I got to go fast. Like I said, I, I, I love training with Nicky Rod. He's 250, but he, he's a great student of, of the game. You know, I, he goes fast. I go fast. It's a lot of fun for me. I enjoy that. Yeah, I think a, I think a big part of it is actually it comes down to trust and communication with your partner. If it's someone that you know and whether you, you might have a spoken or even an unspoken agreement about how you're going to spar just, you know, after training with the same person for years, you get to the point where you're kind of in tune with them and you know you can go in there safely and you kind of have a feel for what they're going to do. Yeah. Where it tends to be scarier is that situation where it is the new person, you've never sparred with them before and you don't know what their intentions are. I mean, I've, I've sparred with people who were like borderline trying to apply strikes in jiu-jitsu and we never discussed yeah. such a thing. I mean, that can be, look, if you want to do combat jiu-jitsu, we can do combat jiu-jitsu, but we should at least agree upon it. But there will be people who you spar with them and they just start doing weird stuff that you don't expect. Like they start trying to slap you or hit you or they start trying to slam you or they just go faster than you want them to. And, and that's always the risk 
you know, when you are a target, as you said, you know, being a, a known figure in the community and having a prominent gym, there will be situations where people show up at your door. And they they want to go street fighter on you, right? They want to see who's the better fighter. Uh, I've had guys literally try to stop my head. Yeah. I literally had a guy trying to stop my head. And when, you know, I armbarred him very hard and, and, you know, like the guy was, you know, s- screamed and then ran out and threw up because he was going so like this was a fight for his life and we we're just training. Yeah. I've had a guy, a blue belt. So the, theoretically the guy should have known, like he, he went so freaking hard. I submit him three times with three different techniques. And then he cut me open with his elbow. And I said, you know, I couldn't continue because he was bleeding fairly profusely. And I was like, listen, how is this good for your, for your game? Where tell me one of the submissions that I hit you with. He could not tell me one of the three that I hit him with because he was going, this was a fight Mm -hmm. and he was already a blue belt. So you already know, you know, like, so how is this, if you don't even know what you're getting hit with, how, how are you going to be, how are you trying to get better? This is training. You know, if you want to fight me, that's okay. Just, just let me know we're fighting, you know, but if we're in training in a classroom, we have rolling and you kind of going so hard that you can't even see what, what I tapped you with. You don't, you did not have a good training session. Yeah, I think that is the worst thing is when there is a misalignment of expectations between who's training. I mean, the reality is like, look, for a lot of people, if you're 20 years old and jujitsu is your life and, and it's the only thing you got going on, then maybe your preference is to just go all out in every single role. But I mean, I don't know about you, but man, where I train most of the black belts, they're all like, you know, like accountants and <laughs> they're older <laughs> dudes who they're, they're not in there because they want to murder everybody every single role. They want to progressively improve. And, you know, if you want to spar hard with them, that's fine. You can do that. That, but it's all about managing expectations and knowing what you're getting into. Yeah. What you don't want is a situation where one person comes in thinking it's a friendly role and the other person comes in thinking they're there to win the Mundials, right? And that yeah. happens sometimes. I mean, I I have been in that situation where all of a sudden my opponent just starts trying to strike me. And I was like, what the fuck? I thought we were doing jujitsu. <laughs> I was talking to Preet Mikkelsen on the podcast. Yeah. Who, you know, his whole game is he plays like defensive turtle type stuff. And he was telling an anecdote about how one time he was playing that game against someone and the person started slapping him and he kind of realized okay this person isn't here because they want to actually work on this stuff they're there because they want to take me down a peg and they want to they want to crap on my game so they're just going to start striking when i don't expect it i mean that's really it look if you want to roll hard you can roll hard if you don't that's fine too but making sure you're on the same page with your opponent is is kind of the most important thing and that's why i think that the new guys are usually the most dangerous because you don't know what they're thinking and what their expectations are when you roll yeah. with them. And they don't have skill levels. So basically they're just kind of in their mind is they can use whatever just kind of they know, which is not a whole lot. And, mm-hmm. you know, they can become very, it's, it's okay, but they need to understand that if you're going to do that, it becomes closer to a fight than a training. And, and therefore you need to understand that when I get to that submission, which could be very, very quickly, I'm going to shut it down. It's not, okay, let's just play around here because they usually, like you said, their expectations, I don't know what I'm doing. I'm just going to like flail around. And, you know, if I, if I see something, I'll rip it, you know, and, and that's not good training, but I've had that happening with some blue belts by which time they should better understand better. But, but generally speaking, as you progress through the art, you kind of become a little bit more knowledgeable what it's about. You know, this is school. You want to have a fight. Yeah, I mean, you know, like, you know, you want to ha- have a hard rolling? Go say, hey, listen, I'm training for a tournament. Can we go hard? Mm-hmm. Now it's, it's like, okay, we both are on the same page. Yeah, yeah. And I think that becomes especially important when you're talking to the instructor or when you're talking to an, an older grappler because – like, I don't think people understand, you know, when, when you're old, your injuries don't always heal back up as well as when you were young. And a lot of the time, older people have a lot of other responsibilities going on in their life, right? If you're the, if you're the head instructor of a gym and some guy goes ham on you and injures you because he did something stupid, now he's messing with your livelihood. He's messing with your ability to perform on the job. So it's really important to be clear with expectations about people when you're training with them. It's not even that the other person might 
not be able to or want to go hard with you but it's just that if they're not expecting it it can catch you off guard right i mean if i'm if i think we're just doing a friendly light flow roll and then you power double me out of nowhere just from the fact that i didn't expect it it increases the risk of injury because i didn't know that we were doing that so it's absolutely communication is like with relationships communication in jujitsu is, is key to making sure that it's a, a good experience for both you and your training partner i find so sometimes you can i've had instances where you can communicate all you want you know, I, I have had instances literally, I, I, I just, I, multiple times where, you know, to me, once you get to Bluebell, you kind of been around a little bit. So you kind of maybe don't know everything, but you, at least you kind of start to feel what the etiquette is so forth. But I had guys, you know, maybe a day I'm, I'm beat up, you know, my, my elbow hurts, I'm limping and I, I walk around roughly 160 and a, you know, guy 235 that, you know, has been training for eight years. Like hey, if you want to roll on, I'm like, listen, I'm kind of beat up. I'm only, you know, training light today. Oh, no worries. We'll train light. And I look at him I, and I'll say it to his face. I guys, you know, if you're listening, don't ever be afraid to say no to somebody, because if you feel uncomfortable, or if you don't want to train with somebody, because you believe you're going to get hurt, you could say no. I'm stupid though. I said, no, like, listen, you don't know how to flow roll. And he's like, no, 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 don't worry. I'll, I'll go light. You know, literally, you know, seven seconds later, he elbows me hard in the back of the head. Mm-hmm. I, you know, like it once, once that happens, it's like, okay, I know what we're doing now. Like not even five seconds later, I got him in a, in a Dars choke. And I'm, you know, once I get pissed, I'm, I'm like squeezing and he's like, <laughs> you know, and I'm, when I let him go, I said, you ever do that again, I'm going to put you out because I tried to communicate with you. You told me, yes, I didn't believe you. And I said that to you, but you insisted. So this is what's going to happen. I will give you a chance. So it's not, I'm going to go after you with a vengeance. I'm going to give you a chance within, you know, to, you, you can decide very quickly. It, it takes a second or two to, for you to feel the intensity. Once I feel that intensity, it's on. If not, then we're going to have a nice roll. Yeah. To be fair, I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll play the, I'll defend the white belts for a second. To be fair, with a lot of- No, this was not a white belt. This is a guy that was training oh, eight, okay. in eight or nine years. So this is not a white belt. Well, then he's got no excuse. Then he's got no excuse. What I was going to yeah, say- Yeah, exactly. That's what I'm talking about. Because with white belts, you understand that because they don't know any better. Yeah. But if somebody has been training eight or nine years, you, you know better by now or should know better. That's a totally different story. With white belts, you have to kind of come to terms with the fact that because- this is so new they can wind up going into fight or flight without realizing it and then yeah. suddenly even even if they're trying not to they're elbowing and kneeing and you know headbutting yeah. it just it happens <laughs> because they don't have the composure but if that's happening with someone who's more senior especially at eight or nine years experience that, that's actually kind of tragic because one of the things that i love about training with people who are brown and black belts is i can be almost assured my safety when i'm having a, a friendly role with someone who is my experience level i know that the odds of me getting injured are super low because I know that they're experienced and they're going to take care of me. And if that trust gets violated, especially after we specifically agreed not to do this and then they try to murder me, that's that's really tragic because to me, one of the most important things about being a senior belt is that you can be trusted. Yeah, that's actually to me, I think more than technique. The thing that I want out of a black belt, especially an instructor, is I want to know that I can trust them to do the right thing and to take care of me both on and off the mats. And so if you've got someone who is a senior rank and they're trying to hurt people, ugh, that's really toxic. Uh, I mean, it it's rare because usually those people get weeded out, but it does happen. Yeah. I, I've certainly seen it, right? And I mean, yeah, they do. Yeah, there's there's enough evidence in our community in the last year or so that we should know that, like, look, there not everyone in this art is a saint. There are problems we have to solve, and unfortunately, it's- exactly, exactly, they're being brought to forefront. I think it's good idea. You know, it's good. I think. You know, here's the reality: in human society, you will never, you know, completely eliminate evil and bad things. But, you know, the more, you know, we can try to sort of have academies with good, good atmosphere. And, you know, when, when people walk to my academy, you know, I, I like to think that they, they believe that safety of my students are one of my top priorities, mm-hmm. you know? Yeah. So anyways, uh, yeah, I think, you know, that goes back to your point where I think there was some movement like where guys, you know, over 50 guys like to train with other over 50 guys. I think that might be better in terms of drilling when you roll, like sometimes, you know, guys that are over 50, over 60, sometimes they don't have the same, their body does not respond yet the same way. Like a 23 year old, a 25 year old guy does. 
you know, in response, and sometimes, you know, the elbows and so forth, it's, it's incidental. It's not intended, but it's incidental. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I'd rather put some of the older guys that are starting out jujitsu with sort of a, a younger, you know, younger blue or purple belt that kind of understands that if he accidentally gets elbowed, doesn't get pissed off and go after him, but he's kind of sturdy. They can take it and help this guy develop yeah. that mobility and develop the smoothness. And I, and I think that that might be a better solution than, you know, you put two guys that are kind of a little awkward, you know, because they're relatively new and, you know, sometimes they elbow each other. And <laughs> so I don't, I don't know what the right answer is, but that's usually how I try to, to answer that issue. Yeah. I agree with that a hundred percent. I know that for many of us, as we get older, jujitsu kind of turns into our social club. <laughs> like, exactly, but I don't yeah. know about you, man, but when I go, when I go to my gym, there's a, always like a, a whole flock of old black belts just sitting on the side chatting. And it's like it, it because the, you, you know, these are your friends, you've known them for so long, you're used to training with them. And if you're not conscious about it, you can wind up creating these little clicks where all of the black belts are only talking to the black belts and then the white belts don't feel included. And that's not good for a variety of reasons, one of which is what you brought up, which is that you generally want to intermingle the different experience levels because otherwise, yeah, you get white belts doing crazy things to each other because they don't know any better. The only thing more dangerous than one spazzy white belt is two spazzy white belts. <laughs> and, <laughs> and I have I have seen this myself. I mean, I remember at, um, at the gym I used to train at, they uh, admittedly were the instructors were not great, which is part of the reason I left. And the they would often leave their white belts mostly unsupervised. And I remember one time seeing two brand new white belts just go at it. One white belt tries to put the one the other guy in an arm bar, and the other guy literally just picks him up and spikes him right on his head. And I thinking, <laughs> Man, this this is not this is not a good advertisement for the art here. Like, really, we this would have worked off better if you were in there learning jujitsu against someone who was a little bit more calm and composed and could walk you through this. And I I agree with you too that as a as a black belt, it is beneficial in a lot of ways to roll with the white belts because. You forget if you're only training with people your own experience level, you forget the kind of intensity that comes from spazzy people, right? Rolling with someone who is in the throes of a fight or flight response is totally different and totally dangerous in a different way compared to rolling with like a black belt who's cool and calm and composed. And if you only roll with the old dudes, then eventually at some point you forget what it's like to be in there with a young, inexperienced person who's frankly terrified of you. That's a very, very different experience. And I think it's always beneficial to roll with people of a gamut of different experience levels rather than just only hanging out with people your own age. Yeah, I, I agree. I, you know, uh, to me, clicks are deadly to any any academy. I don't I don't refer to my school as a gym. I refer to it as a school and academy. We're, mm -hmm. you know, the way I look at it, we're an institution of of learning. And and you know, I want you know the white belts and and blue belts and you know with purple belts and brown belts and black belts. You know, we try to you know sometimes you know go you know for pizza or whatever. I want the you know the senior students to provide guidance to the more junior students, help them sort of. Every, you know, every one of us has gone through that that process before where, you know, we might not be getting it. We might not be getting technique. We're not getting as good as fast as we thought. Or should I do this? Should I do that? What, you know, am, am I on the right track? And I think that's a good way. You know, if you have a good sort of good atmosphere, I think that's when people, you know, the more senior students help guide the, the younger students, both in, in terms of technique, as well as in terms of, you know, how they grow within jujitsu. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely, definitely. I, I think that that diversity of experience is very helpful because it's almost like a mentor system. Yeah. The alternative is a bunch of white belts trying to murder each other and hoping they don't, you know, and maybe the strong will survive. But man, like I, I think that we we as an art have evolved enough that we should be more scientific in our approach now in terms of how we grow our people rather than just letting them fight to the death every single role. Yeah, I agree. Something I'd ask you while I've, I've got you here, are there any skills, tactics, or strategies that you think are uniquely helpful when you're the older person and you're facing off against a, a more aggressive younger person? Is there anything that you would suggest generally in that situation that is good for people who are fighting against someone who's younger and or more aggressive? Wisdom. The longer term view is, okay, if I'm going with this guy, you know, he may, maybe he just mauled, mauled me today, but guess what? I want, you know, I'm committed to this and I will get better. And, 
you know, we'll see where things are in three years. Mm-hmm. Chances are the older person may still be there and the younger guy may not. I've, you know, I've, I can't tell you how many times I've seen a guy walk into my academy, explosive, athletic, fast. You know, he he's every single class, every single day for six weeks, and then he's gone. So you can't hack it because, yeah, that might work on some relatively newer people, but, you know, in six weeks, they're not a world champion. They're not beaten you know, most of the blue belts, they're not beating the purple belts. They're not, you know, they might have ripped out of an arm bar, but that's about it. And, you know, guess what? Then, you know, they start to realize, oh man, you know, there's a lot more to it and, and they just can't hack it. So I think the mentality of, of sort of uh, looking at things in a longer term perspective, that's very helpful. I think understanding that knowledge is power and, and that acquisition of, of techniques, but You know, you can't just acquire techniques, you know, like, let me just, you know, acquire as much as I can. It has to be sort of done in a more strategic way, meaning that, you know, initially when you early stages of jujitsu development, you're acquiring everything, you're acquiring mostly fundamentals, but you're acquiring a lot of different things that ultimately will be, you'll know they might be part of your game. But eventually, once you get past the sort of the basics and the fundamentals, you know, then, then everybody's game, you know, when people become senior blue belts and purple belts, they start to develop their own game. And that's when really things, you know, when things get really interesting, that's when the guy that's older and, you know, is, is, is a purple belt, they, they can sort of like say, okay, I think this kind of family or this, this kind of sequencing of, of things is going to be really useful for my game. So I'm going to focus on studying this you know, I'm going to still come to class and study everything that the teacher shows me, but this is where I'm really going to focus on because I think adding techniques that are ancillary to your game and ancillary, you know, like it's hard to sort of have a certain game and then just like, okay, I'm going to do this. It's hard. It's, it's easier to sort of like, if you're primarily a top player, you know, stringing things, you're transitioning from, you know, from arm bars to kimuras to lower body to chokes is, is, you know, that kind of thing is, is very good. I also encourage a lot of the guys, especially the bigger guys have a good guard game because I've seen, you know, if you go to lower level tournaments and you go look at the ultra heavy guys, you know, it's ugly because basically one guy passes the guard and basically sits there. If he ever tries anything other than kimura or, or Americana, they usually fall off and they're on the bottom. But, you know, if you look at high level guys, they're very, even ultra heavy, they're very technical. And the point is a lot of times, especially at the bigger guys, if they have a good guard game, they're much more willing to take risks from the top. So that way, if they screw it up, they know they have the confidence of being able to bail out and get back into a a dominant position that they will constantly try different submissions from the top and become very technical. Whereas guys that have very good top game and not no guard game, you know, they basically get past the legs. And now they're petrified to do anything because they're afraid that if they get swept, they're really screwed. So I think people, when and as they as they try to grow in jiu-jitsu, you you know, you you want to think about it. And if you don't know, ask your teacher like, what are some of the things I should be working on in the next three to six months? That's you know, that's kind of a thing that people tend to forget it, but that can be very very important towards development of you know faster development. You know? Yeah, yeah. I think the big thing you're touching on there across the board is that when you're the the wiser, older person, you're generally thinking long term in terms of strategy, whereas a, a person who is less experienced might be thinking more in the moment and more tactically. The benefit to being the wiser person on the mat is that you can focus on the war instead of any individual battle. And I find that sometimes, right? If I'm sparring with someone and I don't feel safe, Man, there were, there was a time when I would fight to the death before I tap out to a lower belt. Right? <laughs> Whereas now I I don't care. I really don't care if I were sparring with a white belt or a blue belt and I didn't feel safe. I felt like something was about to go wrong either for me or for them. I'll just tap out and I'll just bail or I'll just tell them like I'm I'm not really comfortable with the way that this role is going because it's better for me to focus on a long-term strategy and and come back later and still be able to train than to get injured and to be off the mats for who knows how long because I was trying to prove something to a white belt, right? Like, yeah. what do I have to prove to a white belt? The the other thing, too, is that, yeah, like you mentioned, newer people, they tend to get really demoralized when they lose and they, they're they measuring them 
themselves up based on how they performed on an individual day. Whereas I think more experienced grapplers have a wider view and they're okay with losing in the gym. They use that as an opportunity to pivot and develop and get better. And their focus is not necessarily on beating their training partners in class, but it's about having a path to personal improvement and improving their skills. And like you said, I, I feel like more experienced people are often more deliberate with their learning. Like you mentioned, new people, they're just constantly trying to absorb as much as possible without really having a framework to hang all of that off of. And in reality, they probably wind up discarding most of that stuff. Whereas I feel like people who are more experienced are always asking, how do I integrate this with my existing strategy? Does this match my existing strategy? Do I need to change my strategy? There's a much more deliberate practice towards putting together ideas and building up a game plan. And like you said, often the the tortoise beats the hare and, and these kinds of things, because yeah, you will get people who are young and athletic and they might whoop ass for a month or two, but either they get demoralized or quit or something I'm increasingly starting to realize is, you know what, they're gonna get old too. You know, when you've been training for oh, decades, an extra five years doesn't seem like that long a time anymore. Yeah. And yeah, you might get some 20 year old who's coming in and whooping ass. But now I look at them and I just think, you know what? Five or 10 years from now, you're not going to have that edge anymore. And then you got to fight me on my battleground. <laughs> you know, that that is really technique versus technique because you're not going to have athleticism to defend or to, to rely on anymore. So uh, yeah, time is definitely an advantage. The older people can also, I think they're kind of, I think they should be thinking about the sequences they should be using against specific sort of positions or specific attacks or specific defenses, you know, whereas, you know, like sometimes if you're young and athletic, you tend to rely more on instinct, mm -hmm. which is good until people figure out, you know, how you counter the things and then they're going to counter you. So I think they kind of almost think about that, you know, it, it, it comes a little easier when you have wisdom a little bit is sort of think about, okay, what is the next step? Where is he going with this? And how can I stop him from doing that? Maybe, or maybe if I can't stop him, can I make him overshoot? Or can I actually capitalize on where he's going? So I think there's there certain things. And I think, you know, the reality is when I started Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, you know, I was one of the youngest guys, but back then pretty much most of the students were like black belts and other disciplines. So a lot of the guys were like, late 20s, early 30s to late 30s. Whereas now most of the students I would consider probably being more sort of a typical student is more in their 20s. But also there's also been an influx recently of, of I think a lot of older people, you know, people, you know, take it up as a hobby. And I think it can be a great hobby, but you need to kind of be in a good school. Let, let me put it this way, because, uh, you know, you don't want to be in a place where like, it's, it's like, a, Oh, fresh meat. You, mm -hmm. you know, if you're in a school like that, it's just, that's, that's, you know, that I, that's not a school. Yeah. Yeah. I, I agree a hundred percent, you know, fight club, the dingy garage it's, it's, but if you get a good school, you know, people, I, I think, you know, jujitsu can be made for people that, you know, different, you know, we have very tough young black belts that fight professionally and we have, you know, older black belts that are, you know, technically very good and, and help teach and help guide the, the students as well. And I think there's room for both, both, both kinds, you know? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, let me ask if people want to check you out, check out your, your podcast, check out your school, where do they go to do that? Just type in silver Fox BJJ <laughs> in Google. <laughs> It'll, everything will pop up. Easy to find. <laughs> Silver Fox BJJ. So we have Silver Fox BJJ. It says Silver Fox two words, but I think it might come up even if it's one word. God. We have a YouTube channel. We have we do daily, uh, not daily, weekly troubleshooting every Friday, 10 30 a.m. Eastern time. So that's 7 30 Pacific time. I actually just put out like all the different time zones. So we basically it's a QA where we I basically go over, you know, people have a problem with specific moves, specific techniques, and we try to fix it. You know, my website is silverfoxbjj.com. On Facebook, I'm Silver Fox. There's a picture of me. That's my personal account. There's an academy account. So on Instagram and the academy account where there's the school logo, other people help me manage that because I'm just getting pulled in too many different directions. But if you send me a message to the personal account, I will, I will answer it for sure. Awesome. That's how I reached out to you in the first place. So definitely yeah. works. 
<laughs> awesome. Well, th- and thank you so much for joining us. I really appreciate it. And of course, to the listeners, if you want to learn more about our stuff, I think people know how to get there. BJJMentalModels.com. Got a full database of all the concepts we talk about on the show there, as well as a contact form to get in touch with me and a link out to everything else that we do. And of course, if you want to check out our premium services, premium.bjjmentalmodels.com. Really awesome site that we offer where there's a lot more expanded content, a lot more courseware and some direct coaching and also access to our awesome community. So again, that's premium.bjjmentalmodels.com. Carl, thank you so much for coming by. It was awesome to finally get a chance to talk to you. I really appreciated this conversation. I think it's going to help a lot of people. It was my pleasure. Thank you for having me on. Thanks again. And of course, to all of the listeners, thank you to you as well for hanging out with us. And I'll talk to you guys next week. 